Hi, my name is Lainey Dratch and I'm a genetic counselor here at the Penn FTD Center. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about genetics and genetic counseling as it pertains to FTD, ALS, and FTD, ALS. So we'll briefly review the role of genetics in FTD and FTD, ALS and talk about why family history is important. We'll very, very briefly go over what genetic testing options are available and also discuss what is genetic counseling. As some of you may have already heard, we kind of categorize FTD in two ways. There's the sporadic type and the familial type. What we mean by sporadic is FTD occurs in a person without any family history of FTD or a related neurological condition. So it just kind of happens out of the blue for them. By familial FTD, we mean FTD occurring in a person when there's already an established family history of at least one or more people with um, FTD or another neurodegenerative disease. So about 40% of FTD, so just under half, falls into this familial category where there's other family members affected, and about 60%, um, so a little bit more than half, occur in this sporadic way where it's just that one person diagnosed. In ILS, it's a little bit different. The numbers are um, much higher for sporadic, about 90 to 95% of ILS happens in just one person in a family but about five to 10% of ALS is familial, meaning it affects multiple family members. Because we're talking about genetics, I thought it would be nice to quickly review what are genes. So genes are the instruction manual of the body. They tell our bodies how to grow and develop. They control lots of aspects of our body's functions. So um, our, you can think of our DNA as kind of like a letter code. It has fewer letters than are in this example, and this is sort of a silly example, but I think it demonstrates the point of how important our code is. So if you have just one spelling change in your DNA, it can change the meaning of um, the instructions. So for example, the sentence the hip and the leg, just by changing one letter, it can be changed to the hip and the peg, I think having a peg leg is a little bit different than having just the regular old leg that grows out of your body. So you can see that, you know, just changing one simple letter can change the instruction manual. And this is the same case in FTD and other disorders where we have differences in our spellings of the genes that cause the instructions not to either really make sense or the, the um, product of what the gene's supposed to make can't really perform its role in the body the way it's supposed to, and then it can lead to problems with the brain or whatever is affected by the error in the genetic code. If ALS or FTD is familial, it's usually inherited in what we call a dominant pattern. So for example, in this family, dad, we can say has FTD. And so you can see that little check mark and the X, the check is the normal spelling of the gene and the X is the bad spelling of the gene. We all have two copies of each gene. So there's a 50% chance that dad can pass on that check mark, the regular copy of the gene. There's also a 50% chance that dad can pass on that X or the copy of the gene that causes FTD. So each child has a 50% chance of inheriting the gene that can cause FTD if it's inherited in this dominant pattern and one parent is affected. If you came to see me in a genetic counseling session, we would discuss this in more detail as you had questions. So when we talk about genetics in FTD, ALS, or the combination of both disorders, we typically talk about the big three because there are three genes that are causing the majority of familial FTD and ALS. So C9-ORF72, which we often refer to as just C9, is the most common cause of FTD, ALS, or FTD, ALS combined when we're talking about families with multiple members affected. There also are a number of people who have sporadic FTD, so it's happening out of the blue, that have uh, a change in this C9-ORF72 gene. This gene is a little bit different from others in that the way that the, the change works is it's a repeat expansion. So instead of having just one single letter change like I showed you in the peg leg example, there's actually extra genetic material in this gene. We call it a repeat expansion. There are 
letters that are just repeated in there more often than they should be. So C9ORF72 can cause FTD or ALS or both in the same person and in the same family. It's been associated with some other features, not just FTD and ALS, including some psychiatric illnesses and also some Parkinson-like features. Um, so C9ORF72 um, has a, a broad impact. And again, we would talk about the details of this much more if you came and talked to me in a genetic counseling session. DRN and MAP-TAU um, are these two other genes that also have been implicated in a, a decent amount of familial FTD. Um, you can see some of their features listed here. Um, they are, have some other features associated with them as well, including this Parkinsonism, and then some other variants, in cort including corticobasal syndrome and progressive supranuclear palsy. So what we uh, expect to see in somebody with each of these different genetic differences as you can see by the uh, characteristics listed on the screen, differs. So knowing which gene is causing somebody's disease can help us make predictions about what symptoms they might experience, but it doesn't allow us to say for any one person, you know, how old they will be when they um, develop each symptom, if they will ever develop a certain symptom. Um, but it does provide some other helpful information for families and for potentially clinical trials, which we'll talk about in a little more detail. So, um, you know, while these are the big three, they're not the only three. There are lots of other genes that are a little bit more rare uh, that can cause FTD or ALS or both. Some of them are listed on the screen below. Um, and there are lots more being discovered as we continue to do more research. Uh, and a lot of this research is fueled by participation by people like you. So thank you for allowing us to continue to understand this disease better. And I'll talk to you a little bit about genetic counseling, which is my role on the team. So genetic counselors are really involved in a lot of different ways. So we can explain to people the genetics of FTD. We can do risk, ass risk assessments and um, take family histories. We can explain what your genetic testing options are. And then when, if you do pursue genetic testing, we can help you understand the results and their implications for you and your family. And we can also help in identifying support and resources because we know that these are really difficult conditions, not just for the person affected, but for the entire family. So we of course know that and we're members of your team for the patient themselves, but also for the entire family during the session and beyond. So, you know, we're really here to be an advocate for you for whatever you need. We also are really good at coordinating with med medical team members beyond just the genetic counselors. Um, we work very closely with the neurologists and social work and whoever else you might need to interface with as part of your visit or as part of your care. And I want to emphasize that just having a genetic counseling session does not mean that you have to have genetic testing. You can come talk to me for a full hour, hour and a half about all of the ins and outs and talk to me about all of your concerns and at the end of the session decide, you know, I really don't want the genetic testing. And that's completely fine and a completely acceptable decision. Everyone makes their own choices and I'm happy to help you weigh the ins and outs of all of the different factors. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's your decision whether or not you want to have genetic testing. And that's the case for everybody. So um, there's no question too small to ask a genetic counselor. You can you can ask us anything. And so I've been talking a little bit about genetic counseling um, in terms of, you know, coming to see me for a clinical appointment. There's actually two ways that you can see genetic counselor. There's clinical genetic counseling and research genetic counseling. And that coordinates with the type of testing that you can have ordered. So in clinical testing, the um, blood or cheek swab sample is used for diagnosis or risk information. The results are returned to us and also to you and you pay for the testing and by you i mean most often your insurance or you can choose to self-pay again we can talk about ins and outs of that and the results are made part of the patient's medical record so that they can be used for medical management and decision making um, and for whatever else you might want to use them for so this is typically um, warranted for people with a family history um, of, of ftd but can also be done for for people who are apparently sporadic um, and 
you know, this, there are some nuances to this and that it does have identifying information on it. So we can talk about the ins and outs of what that means for you if you, if you have an appointment with me. Um, and it also does allow for you to use this for things like clinical trial enrollment and um, other medical procedures. On the research side, if you do genetic testing, it is used primarily for scientific knowledge and um, treatment discovery, and the results go to the researcher. The cost also goes to the researcher, so that's great in that you don't have to pay for anything, but it's usually not um, done in your name. It's anonymous, so it's not going in your records. It's going to a research record. And because it's done in a research lab, which is not subjected to the same amount of regulation as a clinical lab, you usually can't use these results to medical decisions made based off of them, and sometimes even you can't use them to get into a clinical trial. So there are pros and cons to both, and they will weigh differently for each person. So again, that's why I'm here to help talk you through all these things. So if you came for genetic testing in the clinical realm, you know, there's usually multiple steps to the testing. I won't go through all the details right now, but I've included them on the slide in case you're interested to skim them over. But, um, you know, we usually start with the C9-ORF72 gene because that's the most common and also has a little bit of a different testing methodology. And then we proceed to bigger tests as we go along, with the biggest test being what we call exome sequencing. And that's a test that looks at the important parts of all of our genes. There's a lot of nuances to it, and again, I would explain that to you in more detail. But um, this allows for access to the data over time. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention that if that's sort of the broadest level of testing that we're doing right now and allows us to keep looking at the data over time as we make new discoveries. So results can come back in several different ways from testing. Um, and again, we'd go over this in more detail, but briefly, they could be positive, meaning we identify the, the cause of FTD or ALS in the family or in, in that specific person. They could be negative, meaning we didn't find any differences in the DNA that we would expect to cause um, the conditions, or they can be uncertain, meaning we found a genetic difference, but we're not quite sure what to make of it yet, and we'll watch that over time. So one of the reasons that we um, talk about genetic testing in people who have the condition is because this, if we find a genetic cause for their disease, we can actually offer predictive testing to their family members. And so this is somebody who does not yet have any symptoms, but is in a family where somebody has FTD or ILS or both, we can test them for the genetic cause of FTD or ILS in their family and see whether they have that specific genetic change or not. This is a very personal decision. It's a very complicated decision. It involves genetic counseling to, to go over, you know, why people are pursuing it, what they think they might do with that information, um, you know, what are the benefits and limitations, those sorts of things. And it usually involves a neurology exam for baseline assessment, as well as a psychiatric assessment to make sure people are, are in a good spot to get this information because it can be really challenging information to learn. So why do we do all of this genetic testing and research and, and um, collect all this, you know, the exome sequencing, I was saying that really broad testing on people is because new genetic associations continue to be discovered all of the time. A paper just came out in March 2020 identifying a new gene, albeit a rare gene. This is another paper up here, the CCNF gene that was discovered back in 2016. So just new papers come out all the time, often starting with just, you know, being a rare discovery in one family. But over time, as we do more research, we might learn that some of these are more common. And then we can offer follow-up for people who've had negative or uncertain information in the past. And so why does this help our families? So unfortunately, as, as you all know, these, these conditions are life limiting. And so our patients might pass away before we can obtain samples for further testing. So given that um, you know, new discoveries are being made, new clinical trials are becoming available, and family members might want predictive testing, doing genetic testing while the person is still alive and going all the way up to that level of exome sequencing allows us to continue to help these families over time. Um, in, in taking a look at new genes that may be uh, discovered and have associated clinical trials, and then allowing family members to get predictive testing based off of that. So there are lots of, of, of different nuances that go into these things, 
Um, and again, I'm happy to talk to anybody who has questions. Um, so if you ever have questions about genetics, you can reach out to the Penn FTD Center and ask for Lainey or the genetic counselor, and both of those will get you to me. And I hope you all are doing well and staying safe during these crazy times with COVID. Thanks and be well.